Good morning, church. Why don't we uh, take a moment here to pray and uh, to give this time to totally hear from God and to be open to what he wants us to receive. So let me pray. God, we ask that you would move by your spirit, that, Lord, we would have humble hearts to receive this message today. God, uh, move and, and, and correct and encourage and work in your church, the body of Christ. God, we are grateful for all that you're doing. And Lord, we need you so much right now. And we need you to manifest your presence in our homes and in our hearts during this time. So we ask that you would come and continue to visit with us again, Lord. And may we be more like Jesus through this sermon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, it is good to be back with you here online. And thank you for tuning in. And all those who are guests, maybe your first time watching, welcome to Calvary Church Online. And uh, today I would like to just kind of start off with um, a little heads up that God's been burning in me some things that... Um, make me a little nervous to share. And, uh, you know, the joke is that when you have a tough sermon to share, you have your car running, you leave it running so you can, so you can leave. Well, because of online church, the only people I have to run away from is the tech team right now. And, uh, I think I can, I can outrun them. I think maybe not, but, um, so I don't have my car running, but I would encourage you to have an open heart today to what we need to hear as a church. And, you know, there's things that God gives me to say, um, almost, you know, really like a prophetic voice. Uh, a prophet is someone who's a mouthpiece for God. And there are seasons in my life where God has given me things to share with the church. And this is one of them today. And there are times where I've held back and I've suppressed it and God has rebuked me for it. And so I cannot suppress or hold in what God is wanting me to share with the church. And so I am submitting to God and I'm submitting to listening to him. And I would just encourage and ask you to be open hearted and minded about what he's trying to share with us as a church today. And so, yes, I will begin um, then with that disclaimer in the beginning here. I want to go to Luke 5, 1 through 11, and I entitled this message, The Church is Essential. In a week that has been pretty difficult for us, I am preaching on The Church is Essential, and I'm going to Luke 5, 1 through 11, because I want to make sure we are reminded of what the church is. I don't want our identity to be mistaken. Sometimes churches can have identity issues themselves. And so we need to make sure that we know our true identity as the church. And we are very important. We are very important to God. He died for us. And he sees us as his greatest method to reach our community and our world. So we are very essential. And so buckle in if you have any seat belts in your couches and get ready for this one. Luke 5, verse 1, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Let me just go ahead and stop right there. I want you to notice where Jesus was preaching. On the shore of Galilee, not the temple, not the church. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, who was also known as Peter, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. How awesome is that? The pulpit that Jesus had at this moment was a boat, a fishing boat. His location 
was out in the Sea of Galilee, and he's hanging out with a fisherman. And then he says this, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, I love that, he stops talking to the crowds, and now he focuses in on one person. He focuses in, focuses in on Simon. He says, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they had began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon with both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. He recognized he was in the presence of God in that moment, for he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him, his partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Wow. Jesus was looking at the church when he called Peter to follow him. Jesus was looking at the church. Peter was the beginning of the church. That's amazing. And Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. His focus would go from literal fish to now catching people, gathering up people to come into the kingdom of God. Notice where Jesus found Peter again, not at the temple. Jesus found Peter at his workplace. Jesus asked Peter to cast the boat on the other side. God has been having the church, Calvary Church, fish on the other side, outside of this building. God has been having Calvary Church fish in different ways to reach different people in different places. Our broadcast has been going to other states and other countries and into homes that would never, ever come into these walls. We've been fishing on the other side of the boat. And Jesus began to build the church with people. And then he told the church to go reach people. And not one brick was mentioned. Not one brick was mentioned in the establishment of the church. Because Peter was the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ. And then Peter's role was to go reach the people, to go reach the community. But here's the thing. Jesus did form a community. Jesus formed a group of followers, and the Bible calls that the ecclesia, the fellowship of believers. And I miss the fellowship. I miss the assembly. What we are missing and grieving about on Sunday mornings of missing the fellowship and the singing together and the gathering together, it all hurts to not have because we're meant to be together. We're, the body is meant to live in fellowship and in unity and community together. That is all supposed to be happening. So everyone who's feeling that, that depletion of it, everyone who's feeling that hurt of not coming together, we have a right to because that's not actually how it's supposed to be. It's not. But I will say this, to demonstrate love to our surrounding community and to protect the health of our fellowship, we have taken a season away from coming here. We have done that and we're making it through and we're doing well. We're doing well, we're making the most of it. But what we've seen now is God has helped us to see how essential we are for one another. So we would never take that for granted ever again. I mean, I'm never going to take for granted ever. I never did. I never will. The value of coming together as a body of Christ because of what we've been through. So I believe we needed to go through this to truly value living in fellowship and biblical community with one another. 
But we need to be careful, though, because gathering to worship God together is a piece of who we are. It's not the whole. Gathering together is just a piece. It's not the whole. Fellowship is an important part of the mission. Coming together to worship God, they did that. They gathered at the temple. They did it daily at that time. That was important, but it's just a fraction of who the church is. The mission continues. The mission is also a major part. The majority of what Jesus did was travel around the towns and share the gospel. Going to the temple to worship or to pray was a small portion of his custom and the same for all those who followed him. I've been trying to stay positive because I know that Sunday morning is a portion of our faith but there is so much more during this temporary season that we're going through. The church is not losing and the church is not defeated. That's for sure. The church is being refined and repurposed. That is for sure. We're learning some things about how important the church is. And what I mean by the church is I mean the body, the people, the ones who say we follow Jesus. Listen, here's a, a really important takeaway. Nothing can stop the church. I'm not afraid. Nothing can stop the church. I'm not worried. Nothing is going to stop the church. My son, he likes to make, uh, he likes to make uh, makeshift like water streams in front of our house on the curb. And what he does is he, he pulls our hose out and he puts water on the curb and it flows towards a drain and all I can see is my water bill going up um, but at least he's having fun and being creative <laughs> but I, I watched him one day as he was gathering rocks and gathering grass and he was putting them in the way of the water and he was trying to stop the water but here's the thing that that hose kept running and and he only had so many rocks and so much grass and, and that water just could not be contained. It found a way through. And God will never be contained. God will never be contained in this building that I'm in right now. And he will not be contained because the church will prevail. The church will find a way around any dam or blockage that is getting in the way of the church. And that's what we're doing. We are finding another way around to be the church. That's what's happening. And we're overflowing into our community in amazing ways. I've been hearing the stories and they've been amazing. The church cannot be stopped. All the forces of evil can try, but the scripture says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do we believe that God is in charge? Do we believe that God is in charge? Do we believe Ephesians chapter one? I'm gonna to turn to that. Ephesians chapter one. And it says in verses 21 through 23, now he, Jesus, is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ, and he has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ. We are full and complete by Christ, not by attending church. Because Jesus can go wherever we go and Jesus can fill you up right now in your house. And I pray he does. I pray that this week when you get alone with him, Jesus fills you up and makes you full and complete. Because he permeates through anything and he is everywhere with you. He goes with you by his Holy Spirit. He who fills all things everywhere with himself. Notice the word everywhere in verse 23, with himself. Jesus is everywhere. Praise God for that. Praise God. There, that's the authority that we have with Jesus. That's the authority. So do we think that maybe Jesus has everything under control? Do we think that he's in charge? Do we think maybe ha uh, that Jesus has a plan for the church right now? Yeah, I think he does because he has authority over heaven and earth. Jesus has a plan. And I think the plan was to disperse us out of our buildings and into our neighborhoods and community for a season. 
and a lesson. And it's been a hard lesson as a pastor. Trust me, it's been a hard lesson for me. Uh, it's just been weird to preach to a camera. It's been weird not to come to church and use the giftings that I have with the body of Christ. But I get it now. I see what God's doing. God is, is shaking us and waking us up to see that church is a going to church and worshiping God. is just a piece. But the church outside these walls can make a massive difference and impact. Much more than what can take place in the confines of four walls. I have to believe that Jesus is trying to teach us something through this because here's my next thing to think about. Do we really think that Satan has that much power to control the church and shut us down? Do we really think that, it, that, that Satan is greater than Jesus? No. And if it is Satan, let's say it is Satan. Let's say Satan has effectively shut down the church. He hasn't. He shut down the building. He did not shut down the people. Satan did not shut down the people. He shut down the building, if it is Satan. So the joke is back on him. He lost because now the church is outside in our communities as much as we can with the restrictions that we have, and we're making a difference. I mean, that's what I'm watching happen, even in my own neighborhood, even what our church has been doing. I think we need to look at the bigger picture for the church I want to offer another perspective here because if we define the church as what we do for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, then we've stifled the church ourselves. We've stifled the church ourselves. We have shrunk it. We have made the church stuck. If we look at the epitome of our faith as the church is to be here. And again, I'm saying this with my heart grieving that we aren't here but I trust that God has a plan and a purpose through this. So I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to embrace what God's trying to do in this. But I've been doing some biblical math, okay? Some biblical math. And I calculated 168 hours in one week. And one and a half hours is here in the sanctuary. For some of us who serve, we're here for three hours or more, okay? So let's say one and a half, that makes 166.5 hours. We are not in this building. If we do some other math, which I won't put you through because it's Sunday morning, that's less than 1% of your time is being here at this church building that I'm in right now. But the rest of the week, you get to be the church. You get to be the church. <sighs> One of the hard things I feel like God wants me to say is we need to repent for making the 1% or less that we are here more important than the other 99. 99% of our time, we get to be the church. 99%. And by the way, we're, we're being the church when we come together. And, and when we get back in here and we can get back to some type of normal I mean, this, this roof is going to blow off because it's going to be a party. It's going to be incredible, and I can't wait. But we're going to have to be patient because right now it won't be the same. It won't. But there's going to be a day when we all come back in here, and because we lived for Jesus, the other 99, that 1% is just going to be on fire. <laughs> Satan messed up. If Satan was, if Satan was allowed to do this, if, he, if it was his plan to, to knock us out of churches, well, he messed up. Because we're reaching people we've never reached before. We're catching a fire we've never caught before. And when we get back in here, you're not going to be able to contain Calvary Church. Can I get an amen? Someone please stand up. Let's go. It's going to be exciting. But it's going to be exciting because we're not going to just be the church for an hour and a half. We're going to be the church 100% of the time. The 99 and the 1 are going to come together and we're going to do some damage against the kingdom of evil and darkness. And it's going to be amazing. Praise God. We can practice our faith. What am I trying to say? We can practice our faith in more ways than one, and we should. This is why I'm not worried. I'm working instead. This is why I'm not worried. I'm busy working for the kingdom of God. The mission hasn't stopped. It just looks different Persecution, resistance, roadblocks didn't stop God from using Paul. When Paul was thrown into prison, he just started writing letters that changed history for the church. 
God spoke through Paul, through his prison letters, and we continue to be ministered to them. And one of them was Ephesians 1, which I just read. If Paul didn't go through what he went through, we probably wouldn't have some of the words that we have in Scripture. I'm embracing what God's trying to take us through in this season and learning from it. And I would encourage us to do the same. You are essential to God. You are. You are essential to God. You can move around and love neighbors. You can move around and love neighbors. The building can't. I'm here at the building right now. It hasn't moved an inch. But I can. I can move. I can take Jesus wherever I go. We've been taking Jesus into our homes for our own family's sake, for our spouses, for our kids, for maybe grandma, grandpa who lives with us, our friends and family. They've been, in, been introduced to Jesus because the church has left the building because the church can. This building and what takes place in this building is powerful. Do not get me wrong. What takes place at Calvary is unique here in this room because we're meant to be together for worship like that. But what we experience should never get stuck here. We, the church, are a powerful force that cannot and should not be stuck and confined into one place or method. Peter was the fisherman, not the boat. The boat was a tool. The net was a tool. But when it comes to fishing for people, when it comes to the mission of Jesus Christ and gathering the saints, we are God's greatest method. We are not confined or contained. What concerns me more than the schemes of the devil, more than what any power or ruler is trying to do right now, let me tell you what really concerns me is a dying church. That's what would concern me more. I'm more afraid of that. What scares me more is when the church is distracted with the pleasures of this world. That's, that's what's scary. What scares me more is when we are not loving. What scares me more is, is how, the churches make, uh, how the churches make Christians, but we aren't making, we aren't making new disciples. We're actually, we're actually sharing Christians. We keep swapping Christians from church to church, but we're not making new disciples. That concerns me because there's a lot of people who are going to hell and we just keep swapping Christians to different churches. Oh, our church grew. Okay, yeah, we got some new people. They're Christians. And I I love that. I love how Christians are finding a place to worship and gather. But we need to see the, the worst of sinners come to believe in Jesus Christ and then be a part of our family. We need to find our home. Yes, we need to find our place that we can worship God and be a part and be involved in the mission. But man, there's people who have no church at all that we need to go after. They have no salvation in Jesus Christ. What scares me more is a sleepy church, not on mission, while souls are walking into hell for eternity and we're not on mission. That's what scares me. That's what scares me. Matthew 9, it says, it says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest for laborers to go into the fields. Where are the laborers? In that time, where were the laborers? When Jesus was talking to the disciples, where were the laborers? Because the harvest is plentiful. Do you know where the laborers were? They were at the temple every single day. The Pharisees and all their followers were at the temple learning more and learning more and learning more and doing more, but they weren't reaching the lost. Jesus is shaking us up and saying, enjoy Sunday mornings for an hour and a half, but enjoy my mission too. Enjoy it. Enjoy reaching the lost because that's just as exciting or more than coming together with the body of Christ. It's all part of being the church. Man, praise God. So what can we do? Because the church hasn't been shut down. The church isn't closed. It's deployed. And we haven't had to stop being the church. So what can we do? And I'll I'll, I'll admit, it has not been easy to to do the same thing. And maybe that's the point. We're not supposed to to do ministry the same way. But it's not easy 
to love on people six feet away with mask on and everyone feels like they're, they have a plague. It's not easy, but we can do something. We can do something. And the first thing I can think of is, is pray because instead of me focusing on what we can't do as a church, I've been focusing on what can we do? I mean, this all happened so fast right away. We had to go, what can we do? What can we do right now? All right, we'll go online. And so right away, we pivoted and shifted to help our church continue to grow spiritually. And then we were like, all right, what else can we do? I mean, the same day, we were like, activate workers to help those in need for food. We made a link so that people could uh, donate and people could get food. I mean, that's what we did. That's what we are as a church. It was amazing. But we can pray. I think God wants us to be troubled and pray for our unbelieving neighbors just as much as we're troubled by not being here on Sunday mornings. He wants us to be bothered. He wants us to grieve for our lost neighbors and unsaved neighbors just as much as we grieve about not being here. We need to intercede for them. We can do spiritual prayer meetings or prayer meetings six feet apart. One of our church members, Gloria Harrison, her community group comes out here in the parking lot, a little tailgate prayer. Genius. Love it. Way to adapt, Gloria, in your community group. So they come out here and they park their cars and they pray for the church and they pray for our community. That is clever. So we can pray. I mean, that's what Jesus said. The, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. And the first thing he says is ask for laborers. God, I'm asking for laborers right now that we would rise up and be the church that would pave the way and that we would plow the fields around us and help people know and love and follow Jesus because that's what we need. So maybe you do virtual meetings to pray together or maybe you do tailgate meetings to pray together, which is great because you get to be together and you're praying for souls, you're praying for the church, you're praying for the world. You're praying for things to get healed in our land. The other thing we can do is we can talk about Jesus. I love this story. Kevin Powers in our church, he's an usher. He was out fishing one day. He felt drawn to a fishing pond that he never goes to. And he ran into a young adult, a young man. And God, uh, they had come together somewhat, you know, six feet apart or more. And Kevin felt uh, a nudge from the Holy Spirit just pulling him to talk to him about Jesus. So he did. And I'll cut to the chase that day. This young man gave his life to the Lord right there by a pond fishing. It reminds me of Peter when he was fishing. So here we are. We have a modern day story of fishing for men, one of our own people. And they both say in this story that they were not going to fish there, that they usually don't fish there, but they were drawn to fish there that day. That's because God had a plan for the church to show up and the church to go fishing that day, literally, and the church to talk to a person who is welcome and belongs in the kingdom of God. And the church won a soul that day without one brick around it. Praise Jesus. Thank you, God. I've been getting stories from you guys left and right in emails. Thank you so much for sending emails of good reports of helping families in our church, helping families that don't go to our church, bringing food. It's amazing. Talking to people about Jesus, you guys are doing it. We can post all day about Jesus. We're on, our, we're, we're on social media so much, we can post about him all day if we want. We can share articles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can share scripture verses. We can pray for people. There's people praying every day on Facebook. Praise God for that. I haven't seen any of that get blocked yet, by the way. I'm sure there might be some, and I'm sure that will come. But we're going to keep doing it no matter what happens. We can have virtual Bible studies to talk about Jesus. We can have tailgate Bible studies, and we can have 10 or less get together now in community groups and spread out six feet. We can gather in our homes here soon on Sunday mornings. If you're comfortable with it, your family's comfortable with it, You spread out in the house and you can watch the service and worship together and then even talk about the sermon afterwards. But here's the key. See, Jesus, Jesus caught Peter. Jesus went fishing and he caught Peter that day and the rest of the disciples. And then he sent Peter out to catch those who are not caught yet. And what I'm trying to say is, is that God wants us to go after the lost 
the unsaved, the ones who have not come into his kingdom, into the net yet. He's calling us to them, not just another church person. And I don't, don't take that just another. But there are people who are not saved yet, and we have many saved Christians who have connection, and they've been reached, they've been connected, they're growing, but it's time to make room in our lives because Jesus is coming back. Whenever that is, it's always soon. Since he ascended, it's always been soon. It's at any time. We don't know the day or hour, but Jesus is coming back and the urgency is real. And lastly, we can love our neighbors. We can love our neighbors. I'm going to say something really strong and honest, like I already have been this entire sermon, so I'm all worked up to say it. But we can cry of injustices, but when injustice is standing right in front of us in the shape and the form of a human being and our arms are tucked in and our hands are closed and our mouths are shut, that's injustice. That's not the church. That's not the church. We can cry of injustices, but if we're not giving to the work of the kingdom, we need to. We can cry of injustices, but if we're not getting online and sharing our faith or sharing our faith with our neighbor, we need to stop crying of injustice because God says, let a, let a river flow of justice and love and mercy. That's what his word says. We should have a river of love and justice flowing, especially from us. And so we are supposed to share and, the, and love our neighbors as ourselves. I'm almost done, so hang on tight. The Greek word for loving God and, and your neighbor, the Greek word love there is agape, which means to care for the well-being of others. It's, it's to think outside yourself and go, what does my neighbors and my community need the most right now? They need love. They need love. And the greatest commandment was love God. And the second was love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. The church has been deployed to love. To love God wherever we are and to love one another and to love our neighbors as we would take care of ourselves and love ourselves. Nothing's stopping us from doing that. Nothing has to stop us from loving people. Nothing has to stop us from being the church. And we are thinking about the needs of our community, the health, the safety, the lives, but also the gospel, the gospel. And we have a right and a freedom to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community. And God wants to use you and he can do amazing things through you. Don't count yourself out. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. One of our neighbors had surgery last week. My wife and I both felt obligated, not obligated, both felt compelled. It was awesome. I went to her. It was like she knew what I was going to say. And I said, uh, I want to give them a gift card so that they have um, dinner. So that, because mom had surgery, and so she wasn't cooking at the time, and dad was cooking, but we were talking to him about it as we were walking on the road in our neighborhood. And, and uh, both of us, you know, Rachel and I just knew we we're going to give them a gift card to love them. You guys have been sending me stories of how you've been going out getting meals for people and bringing them to their homes. And I love watching the, the it's so weird to call this a good thing, but the drive-bys, like we've turned them into positive things, you know, and driving by and celebrating people's birthdays and graduations and dropping off food for people. We can do that for our friends who need Jesus. We can show love. Even the weird situation and context we're in, we can still show love. We've had volunteers coming to the church outside working hard on our property. Thank you for that. John Nichols, thank you so much for assembling a group of guys and spending time out here. We have volunteers going to the uh, food pantry, Delaware Food Bank, um, going to the, to the racetrack to distribute food. Thank you, volunteers. You guys have been doing so many things. It's been amazing. That's the church. That's the church. And do you catch the acronym I gave you? Pray. Talk about Jesus and love our neighbors. It's PTL, one of my dad's favorite acronyms. Praise the Lord. See, the church praises the Lord with our lives. 
the church glorifies and makes him known with our entire life. So let me, uh, let me close with this. I was thinking about this this week. Because I think about, <clears throat> I think about the, the things that have been happening to the church. And I'm not comfortable with everything that's happened. I'm not comfortable with everything that's going on in the world. But the Bible's clear that we're going to get uncomfortable when we follow Jesus. And things can get worse in the future. They can. Persecution can be real. And I thought about something this week. I was worshiping. Uh, I've been worshiping God in my house. And I've been hanging out with Jesus, reading the Bible and praying. And one day I was doing that and a door, my door was being knocked on. Someone was banging on my door. It was just a kid. It was a kid looking for one of my kids to play. And then I proceeded to go back and to worship God and, and to pray and read the Bible. During this season, I've been caring for my neighbors and helping them out and pitching in where I can with safe distancing and restrictions, trying to be as responsible as we possibly can. We've been letting teens and kids play basketball in our basketball hoop because, you know, they've been together so much in the neighborhoods. And so they've been using our property, and I've been, you know, just welcoming them with hospitality. We've been able to pray with one of our neighbors whose father wasn't doing well and needed some prayer. We've been able to share the love of Jesus with others around us. I've been able to go to Walmart and show kindness and love. What I'm trying to tell you is, is the church hasn't stopped. The church isn't dead. The church is alive. And, it, and it's alive and well if we will be the church. This week, though, someone banged on a door in China. This week, someone banged on a door in India. And they found Christians practicing their faith. They found Christians worshiping God. They found Christians reading the Bible. They found Christians eating together in these homes. And they dragged them out of the house to persecute them, to burn their Bibles, to tell them to stop talking about Jesus in their homes. I thank God that we aren't there yet. But if we ever do get there, we'll be ready. Because Jesus is with them. And the question I've been thinking about today is what will I be caught doing? Will I be caught being the church? Will I be caught being the church wherever I am? Whether it's in this building or whether it's at home. I want to be caught being the church and I'm willing to suffer for the sake of Christ and I'll suffer with joy, suffer with joy because that's what Jesus would do. So I praise God for what he is doing. Even when I don't understand it, even when I don't get it, I don't understand the purposes of it. I thank God for it. Thank you for hearing me out today. Just know that the church is essential. You are the church. We're going to get through this, and we'll be back together to worship again as one body under one roof. But we can make the most of what we're going through right now and be the church. Let's praise the Lord. Let's pray. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's love our neighbors. Let me pray. God, I pray for your spirit to move upon our hearts and our minds today. Lord, love us rebuke us, correct us, encourage us, refine us as followers of Christ. God, you warned us of things to come in the future. So Lord, whatever is going on right now, we can take it as preparation. We also know that you are in charge, that Jesus has authority over heaven and earth. And Lord, that nothing happens without you knowing it. And God, you're permitting things to happen. So we come under your authority in your purposes and plans, we submit to them. God, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the confusion, 
we filter out all those things and we focus in on you and what you want for the church. And no matter what the church went through, God, they continued to focus on being the church. They found a way. The water kept flowing. They continued to be on mission. So God, we're not worried. We're working for your kingdom. We're not afraid. We're engaged as the church. We're activated. So God, be with us as we grieve not being together, as I do, as many of us do. Help us to make the most of every opportunity to praise the Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this word today. Thank you for establishing your church without one brick or mortar. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Enjoy the after the sermon discussion on this one. And um, thank you so much for all you're doing in our community. And thank you for all the prayer and support. It's been felt very much. We really appreciate it. God bless.